Hello. So all this is going to be a little bit peripheral to you hacker community people here, you computer people, but, uh, but there's some uh, uh, points in common, I think. Uh, what I'm going to uh, do here today is I'm going to talk a little bit about SRL and about how I think maybe somehow in my convoluted imagination it may pertain to your youthful desires and aspirations. In the background, there's going to be showing video from Survival Research Laboratories events. Uh, I picked out some of my favorite moments from the videos uh, that reflect a little bit about the reality of what goes on at Survival Research Labs. Now, uh, I started this a long time ago. I started back in 1978. That's way before there were any computers to hack. So I always kind of, I always like to look at it as kind of like reality hacking, because that's kind of how it always was for me. And that's really, you know, what it was, what was possible back then. But uh, for, a, for a variety of reasons, back in 1978, I sat around for two weeks and I thought up this idea. The idea was that you could take, uh, you could take technologies like uh, uh, commercial technologies, industrial technologies, military technologies, and you could, uh, you could recombine them, uh, you could recombine them and you could build huge machines, uh, sets and props, and you could, uh, you could, you could make them and you could actually, you'd stage shows with them, public events, to prove that you had done it, and uh, you would just call it a show. And uh, at the time, I decided I would, uh, I would call it Survival Research Laboratories because I looked around and I saw that corporations were the ones that really get away with the most kind of crazy stuff. And so it became Survival Research Labs. Uh, forming it as a company also caused, uh, a, you know, aside from the fact that uh, the events were a little bit spectacular and kind of uh, not really anything anybody expected, it, it, cre it attracted a lot of attention and it started forming into an actual organization. Uh, it attracted a lot of technical people because it was uh, technical in nature and uh, it ended up, you know, we ended up having like a whole crew and the shows got bigger and bigger and probably starting around 1980, you know, the shows were, you know, there were dozens of people working on these shows. It was almost pretty much like a feature film production for every one of these events. Now, sitting down and thinking up something like this, you know, it's, it's one thing to just say, well, I just sat down and thought it up, you know, and that's really how it came about. But I think it's really important, especially you know, for, for younger people, to really understand how these things come about. You know, because it's the old like, what are you going to grow up to be like a fire person or like a, you know, you're going to grow up to be a cop, you know, or like, you know, the old kind of 50s concept of like what you're going to do when you grow up. Well, uh, you know, that's that's an important part of the question for me as a kid. I grew up in a town, Sarasota, Florida, where there was the highest percentage of millionaires in any place in the country at that time in the 60s, 50s and 60s. So a lot of the kids I grew up with were really rich kids. They had all these fancy things like motorcycles, boats and stuff like that. And I, I was just like a poor kind of middle class kid, but I hung around with them. And very early on, I figured out to like run with that crowd. You had to have like the bikes, the boats, but what I did, my approach was, you know, a little bit of stealing, you know, or this or that, you know, things we don't, you know, which also has a lot in common with the kind of hacking community. But basically, I collected knowledge on how to fix and repair all these kinds of devices when I was a kid, a young kid, and then I could run with that crowd of people. I would have the bikes, I would have the boats, I would have all these crazy things. And, you know, I had a lot of respect because I was the only one that actually knew how to to fix machines that were part of the social coda in the, in the 50s and 60s, like you know, cars and motorcycles. There weren't a lot of people to fix it because they were rich kids and they would pay somebody else to do it. Literally, people, I knew people who would pay people to build their choppers back in the 70s. So, uh, so anyway, I, I, you know, I got through that business and uh, I got out into the real world and I ended up, uh, you know, I ended up, I was pretty good at what I did. I ended up working, uh, working one of my first jobs when I was 18 
was I ended up uh, going up to Eglin Air Force Base and I ended up getting a job with a civilian contractor for the Air Force. And the first thing they said, they said, well, can you read these plans? And I walked into this room and they had these eight foot wide military blueprints for 30 ton targeting robots for F-111 jets to practice on strafing runs. And I looked at the prints and I said, oh yeah, I can read blueprints. And I just went and I said, this means this, this means that, this means that. And the guy goes, you're hired. And so in a month or so, I was the foreman on the project and I was making these huge robots. You know, it was really exciting working with these huge machine tools and uh, you know, all the latest welding gear and all this stuff. And just from nothing, building these things that were like, you know, weighed like as much as a semi truck. Very exciting. But then, I would look out there and I would see the F-111 jets coming down, you know, to make their strafing runs. I would go out there and have to repair these things when they'd blow the drive motors off or something. I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm too leftist for this. You know, I'm too anti-war, I'm too anti-corporate. And so I decided that, uh, that I committed myself and thought about it uh, after the two years I spent learning all these skills. I worked a few other jobs. I went to college, I got a degree in the visual arts, and basically I, I learned the joys of not working and not having a job. And I learned that you could actually exist without working and not having a job. And I said, you know what, I wanna maintain this. And so uh, I came out to San Francisco with all these kind of ideas in my head, and I just sat down and I went, you know, I, I love the tools, I love the techniques, I hate the idea. I don't believe that there's a reason, a practical reason why things are made in the real world. I believe that I can just make up my own reason for it. And so that's, that's, basically, uh, that's basically what I did with SRL. And uh, you know, it's, uh, it's always been about, for me, finding like a place uh, you know, in the margins, like sort of in the cracks of things. Like uh, you know, a lot of people look at, uh, SRL, like if you, like the art world, we do most of these shows in connections with uh, museums and galleries and stuff like that around the world. But the art world always has very, they're very suspicious of me. They're always think that, you know, is this guy just like a mechanic or an engineer, or like sort of a scientist or something like that? I mean, they don't really know because they don't know enough technical things to make a judgment. But on the science world, I know lots of people in the robotics world and you know, the people at places like Boston Dynamics and, you know, the various universities. And they look at me like, you know, this guy seems to know an awful lot of technical stuff and his people seem to know a lot and they get these things to work, you know. But, uh, but like, he's re is he really just an artist, you know? He's not, really, he's not really one of us. And so, you know, that is always the place to be. That is the place to be. The place to be uh, in your career, at least from my point of view, if you're gonna be pursuing the impractical, if you're gonna be pursuing the things that don't matter to anybody else. Like if you're gonna be taking a V1 buzz bomb, and like, which is like a, you know, a real genuine weapon of war, and figuring out how to use it as a sound generating to device, to use in a performance, you know, like that's, that, that's like finding the middle ground there to me, you know, that's, that's, ma that's making just the right compromise and that's what I always want to do. I always want to try, I always am trying at SRL to find like uh, the place that nobody ever looked before with technologies. And so, you know, these, these are just some of the basic ideas around it and, and uh, you know, this has been going on since uh, 1978. Uh, when I started it and coined the name and took out the first ad for Survivor Wishes Laboratories. It's, it's been happening. It's the, the, we were based in San Francisco until I got the boot from there in 2009 and now we're moved up to a bigger location north of San Francisco. But uh, we've done these shows all over the world. Totally, uh, at this point we've done about that 60 of these shows uh, around the world. Uh, we just did a performance uh, last week at uh, at uh, the Computer History Museum in Mountain View. So these performances, uh, you, know, the, you know, 
to me, in the beginning, it was never enough to just like build a bunch of machines and like come up with some kind of weird idea, you know. And you know, I mean, that's kind of it's a little bit too much like sculpture. And so at the outset, my idea was always like, okay, all these machines are going to get made. We're going to make sure they all kind of work and take it out of the setting that most mechanical kind of research things are built in, where if we can just get it to work in the lab, that's good enough. And that was never good enough for me. The idea to really prove the point that these things function and that they really work uh, better than most prototypes in a laboratory, we have to bring them out in the, in the wild. That's what's called robots in the wild. That's what they're doing at the DARPA Robotic Challenge. They're trying to do, you know, to get these things to operate in the wild, and not just one at a time, but get, in these shows, there's 15 or 20 large remote control, sometimes computer controlled devices that are working simultaneously in real time and have to work in a coordinated fashion for 30 minutes to an hour. And that requires not just that the machines work, it requires a sort of a, a group of people that can connect themselves or, or connected enough psychically, you know, and of course, you know, through radio and stuff like that. But it requires logistics, which is the, the which I always felt was the next level above. If you're really gonna say we've fully co-opted the corporate world's way of building and making things and of hacking reality, then you have to really bring it beyond the devices, beyond the actual physical things, and bring it into the, to the world of logistics, where everything, to, the, the fact that it's even going to work at all depends on a decision that you made a month ago about are we gonna do this, bring this part uh, as a spare or not, or is this person gonna operate this machine or are this person gonna operate another machine? And so, uh, so, you know, what it ultimately is, is it's like a shadow. We can go to the next video now. You know, SR, I've tried to create a shadow of like the real uh, corporate military world and, and get it to function in a way that's as effective as those worlds get it to function in the fact, in the, in the sense that there's real products getting made that really function in a robust environment. And uh, it's always been about collecting the right group of people. We have a fantastic crew at SRL. It's all volunteer. I do most of the design myself on, on the machines. I don't build the computers for the machines because that's not really my background. But uh, and I, and I build a lot of the complicated stuff. I'm the one that runs the crazy CNC machines that, that build all these things. And so, uh, but, uh, but it's always about accelerating that curve and getting closer and closer to what's, uh, what's possible in terms of manipulating the physical universe. And uh, to that end, we just recently got the ultimate physical uh, reality hacking machine, which is a German five-axis CNC machining center out of Lick Observatory. And so that will allow us to really, I mean, that is the pinnacle. There is really nothing out there further than that. If you're gonna make real things that are, that are truly, you know, on the, on the highest physical level, that is the type of machine that you need. So there's a couple of things here. The, you might wonder like how the ideas for the, these machines come about. Uh, and that's one, you know, when I started out doing this, you know, the first, the realization that really, that to me hit home and made it, made me make the decision to do it was that I started breaking into old factories in San Francisco. And I looked around at all this equipment and I was like, wow. And I started reading the manuals that were left over in the offices and stuff like that. I mean, there were complete factories in San Francisco, like huge block, square block facilities full of process equipment. I looked at all and I said, wait a minute, all this stuff connects together. It's all universally uh, designed to universally be combined into any kind of process machine. And so, uh, and so I think there's one more, the Moto Man, yeah. Oh, you just passed that, you can run that again. But anyway, uh, 
and so that was, the, that was the realization that made me think, oh, I can do this stuff. Why can't I make these crazy machines and, and put this whole thing together? Because it's all designed to go together. It was all faded that way anyway. It's just nobody ever thought to do anything different than, some, than the practical thing with, or the thing that was going to make a bunch of money. And that was the, the difference at SRL. But, at, but there still, at the time, was a huge amount of resources that had to get put into uh, you know, you, you had to build, you know, a lot of stuff, you know. I, you know, I, I, I uh, bootstrapped onto any kind of technology I could find to build these things so that I didn't have to, like, do any of the developmental work for the components of it. But, uh, but at that time, you know, you were just talking about industrial components or components from uh, laboratories or military parts or ideas from military equipment. But, uh, but nowadays, you know, there's this amazing, it's an amazing time, uh, you know, you can buy equipment for nothing. I mean, literally, you can buy a five-axis machining center if you're careful. I'm not talking about a junkie. I'm talking about a machine that cost a quarter million dollars eight years ago. You can buy them for $8,000. They are out there. You can buy that kind of equipment. It's amazing, an amazing time. The equipment's out there. And then... There's a whole process that subverts the typical uh, research and development process. For example, this is a machine that I retrofitted with an Oculus Rift goggle set and set it up as a true 3D telepresence system. 3D telepresence is something that, you know, friends of mine at NASA have been able to, but they've been trying to solve that, pro that problem for years, literally, to get the video synchronized, uh, to get the latency down to like five to 10 milliseconds, which is what you need to do to control a robot in the wild, you know, they never were able to really solve the problem. Uh, after the Oculus Rift came out in 2013, there was a guy in Canada who just goes, you know, I can do that with one $500 FPGA. And he did a Kickstarter thing, uh, EMR Labs. They built this little box that takes, that allows you to connect your Oculus Rift uh, into there, get the head tracking out, take two composite video streams from your radio wireless video transmitter, bring them, bring them into this box, turn it into field sequential HDMI, and you get a perfect uh, telepresence experience uh, with a range of like a thousand feet. I mean, it's all standard hobby stuff, but you know, that stuff that like, even if you had millions of dollars, that was a problem you wouldn't have been able to solve uh, a year or two ago. Nowadays, there's stuff like that all over the place. Uh, there's a, another, another recent machine that I built called the Spine Robot was, uh, you know, there's always been a problem with tendon-based robots because the key, steel cables wear through the, the, the guides uh, and it's not very durable. A couple of years ago, uh, you know, just looking around on the internet, a couple of years ago, four years ago, I saw that there was a company that was part of the, it was owned partly by the military, that was creating a type of rope for special forces as a steel cable replacement. And I looked at the specs and I was like, wow, a three eighths inch rope, it floats on water. The breaking strength is 24,000 pounds. I was like, you could make a tendon robot with this stuff. And so, I just, you know, I read about it because they had just announced uh, a civilian wing that was going to sell civilian versions of this cable for, uh, for logging, for pulling logs through forests, and for, uh, for uh, uh, rock, rock climbing people. And so I ordered the equipment and I designed a whole robot I call the spine robot around that, which solved the problems that... Uh, people have had with trying to make tendon-based robots, and it's probably got 10 or 12 really hard hours on it. It can lift 400 pounds. It can throw a cinder block about 30 or 40 feet. And so again, that was just something just poking around on the web, you know. It's, it's, these are resources that are only available in the last few years. And so you kids are gonna, uh, you know, you kids are gonna decide, you know, get involved in them. By the time you're an adult, they won't even be machining anymore. They'll just grow things. You know, if you want like a frame for something, you know, they'll grow it or something like that. They'll have smart, you know, uh, smart amoebas that grow into like a tank frame or a car frame or something. So it's all you're gonna all gonna look at this kind of stuff and like 
3D printing and go, God, what a, what a joke that stuff was. But I think I've pretty much used up my time. I, you know, maybe a couple questions if anybody's got any questions. Yes. A CNC is a computer numerical control machine. What it does is it mates a computer and a cutting machine. Uh, the machines that I have, there, there's var varieties of it, but the machine I just recently got from Link Observatory is a 10,000, weighs 10,000 pounds. It has, uh, it has three axes that, that hold a spindle, that hold tools, it has a tool change, it can hold multiple tools. And so what you do is you, uh, you place a, a piece of metal, uh, you know, blank of metal onto the plate in there one of, the, one of the axes, the base of the, of the machine, and then you bring a part in. It can be like a, a part that you designed in uh, SolidWorks or any other kind of 3D program. And you basically run it through what's called a post-processor, and you basically press a button, and the piece of metal turns into the drawing within a, within a, a tolerance of probably about a thousandth of an inch. And some of the parts to ten thousand, a ten thousandth of an inch, because uh, machines like a five-axis machines has what's called uh, thermal compensation. So that's what a CNC machine is basically a mating of a cutting machine and a computer. Any other questions? Well, we did that back in the, 80, the 89 and 90. We actually had a contest with uh, 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 Rodney Brooks out at MIT to be the first people that could run an A-Life code on uh, physical machines. So he had some uh, small machines at his lab, and we built these things called swarmers, which were about the size of a person, uh, squat about the size of a 55-gallon drum, but like two and a half feet high, with sensors where they could detect each other and then basically the program is pretty simple. They would move towards each other and move away from each other. So, you know, we did some presentations of this. We presented it in, in a couple different conferences and it worked pretty good. And uh, Rodney Brooks sent some of his grad students out to look at what we had done. And he said, well, you're ahead of us because ours aren't working yet. So we did do that back at the time, but you know, our applications are sort of, you know, it's a sense of humor at SRL. It's sort of, you know, I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't call it really black humor, you know, sort of more like bleak humor. And so what we did with this, the peak of application for us was in Aurillac, France, there was a seating area where there's a couple thousand people in a building looking out uh, into our performance area. And it was nice and flat. And so we had five of these in there. Uh, we just turned them on, but they were covered with decaying uh, cow parts. And so, the, we don't have any collision avoidance in there. This was 1992, we didn't have any collision avoidance. So they would swarm around and sometimes they follow each other. Sometimes they go in different, they go in various kind of patterns, random kind of fractal kind of behavior. And so, uh, but they were so gross that, it, you know, they would get, I mean, they would get stuck. So, but they were so disgusting. They would go there, oh, so people were literally vomiting and kicking them. And so that would keep them from getting stuck. So that solved the collision avoidance problem. And so uh, that ran for an hour. And people uh, in France did not think it was very funny. Uh, we had a problem in Europe with our shows. Is people don't think they're as funny. They have a different sense of humor than Americans. And so people think that uh, it's, they say it's ugly, ugly, ugly show was what the French said. And that was one of the reasons. But that was, yes, we did. We did, and uh, those are the results. Angry French people. Uh, nothing new with that now. No, not right now. Although, you know, hey, uh, if anybody wants to come and do it as a side project, I mean, it's always the issue. You're talking heavy systems integration to make something like that work. We, that's a weak point. Unless you have a lot of money to pay people to keep the group coherent, it's very hard to do real systems integration across multiple disciplines and you know, keep it together till it's done. So maybe some future dimension we'll be able to do that. Mark, um, so if they want to learn more about the immortal you, tell them about a couple of the books, sci-fi books they can read. 
Well, uh, William Gibson called me up back in the 80s and he said, you know, Mark, I'm going to have you a character based on you in a book that I'm writing called Mona Lisa Overdrive. And I'm like, okay, you drawling sci-fi writer, I can dig it. Thanks for, thanks for the heads up. So there's, some, there's a character that's, spo that's sort of like a you know, reality hacking kind of character in that book. There's a pretty good, a pretty good description of what the original compound was like. Uh, but it really doesn't capture the true Wild West nature of, S of SRL in San Francisco. Unfortunately, we never got captured either. So that was just a lucky break. But, uh, you know, it gives you an idea of it. But, you know, if you want more information, just go to srl.org. We've been on the web since 1990, had a website since 1993. I don't know how many people can say that, but we have had a website since 93 up every day. Or go to YouTube and Genuine Survival Research Labs to see videos of the uh, exploits currently happening at SRL. Thank you.